Now it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Where you can tow. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about toke on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Potland, Oregon at Rolla J Studios. Cannabis. Plus your calls live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy Poop Dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Holland, is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and, and the, the next thing you know, they got 10 years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Gonta graphics, the sultan of sativa statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical Russ Belleville. that I'm angry at David Eckert. You know, he he's just a dude, man. He doesn't know about, you know, cops and Fourth Amendment. Most people don't. I'm not mad at him for not driving away or not refusing the search or whatever. I mean, lots of people get caught up in this, man. It's just, it's just, I, I can't believe this is the country we live in. I can't believe this is the land of the free. I can't believe that our founding fathers aren't rolling over in their graves at stories like this. So let's get back to this search warrant. I read you the whole long Officer Chavez excuses for wanting to search up this guy's ass. And remember, it breaks down to basically three things. The officer thought he looked nervous, the dog alerted on the seat, and some cop from Hidalgo County claims that Eckert hides drugs in his ass. <laughs> that's it, that's, that's, the, that's the justification here, folks. Let's tackle these one by one, shall we? The officer thinks you look nervous. Really? Well, damn, given all the stories lately about how cops are abusing people, I'd be pretty nervous too. It's pretty reasonable for a person to be fearful about an encounter with someone who can shoot you or your dog and get away with it. And apparently can arrange for you to be raped for 14 hours if, it, if, if they feel like it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be a little nervous too, getting pulled over in that situation. The second factor, this dog alerting on the seat, well, folks, we all know about the drug dog situation, don't we? First of all, this drug dog hadn't been certified since 2011. They're supposed to be certified every year. Wasn't certified since 2011. And second of all, I can show you study after study after study that shows without any doubt whatsoever that the reliability of drug dogs is sketchy at best. Dogs evolved to please humans. That's why they're not wolves anymore, folks. They evolved to, to please humans, to, to get us to treat them well and feed them and pet them and care for them and protect them. It is in a dog's very DNA to do something that pleases its master. And if its master is an asshole cop who's looking for an excuse to get probable cause, then that dog's gonna alert. And, and maybe the officer's not consciously doing it, but dogs are amazing at picking up on subconscious cues. They did a study where they took 200 drug dogs and their handlers, and they sent them to one of four rooms. So like 50 of them went to this room, 50 of them went to that room, 50 of them went to that room, 50 of them went to that room. And here's how the rooms were divided. A room could either have drugs in it or not. 
and a room could either have a red flag in it that indicates there's drugs in the room or not. So if you break down the four rooms, you got one room that's got drugs and a flag. You got another room that's got drugs and no flag. You got another room that's got a flag, but no drugs. And you got a fourth room that's got no drugs and no flag at all. And guess what they found? They found the dogs were more likely to alert in the rooms that had red flags, whether there were drugs there or not. That pretty clearly shows to us that they are reacting to the subconscious cue of the handler who sees the red flag and goes, oh, this is a room with drugs in it. So the fact that a drug dog you know, sniffed and alerted at this guy's seat is a sketchy or dubious uh, notion at best. And even if it were accurate, even if the dog was sniffing marijuana scent on the seat, how does that then tell you that the drugs are up the guy's ass, right? The dog didn't alert on the guy's ass, right? <laughs> Presumably he could have, I suppose. Now, maybe there were drugs there in the past. Maybe something was stored under that seat in the past. Who knows? But they never found any drugs in the car. They never found any drugs on or inside David Eckert. And the third claim, this third claim about the unnamed cop making an unspecified claim that Eckert had been caught before with drugs up his ass. Well, that's basically an anonymous tip. Think about it. This officer Chavez doesn't identify the Hidalgo County canine officer in the warrant that he submitted to the judge. He just says some canine officer. So this, this judge gave this guy a warrant to search up this guy's ass based on a, basically an anonymous tip. <laughs> officer, as for why the officer should know that, no details about any alleged incident in which Eckert had been busted and caught with drugs up his ass. Anonymous tips must be corroborated to support probable cause, and this anonymous tip was never corroborated. This judge needs to be disbarred too. We got more when we come back from break. Stick around. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Hey, Tokers and Tokets, Radical Russ here to introduce you to my friend Matt and all the staff at Lush LED Lighting. Growing plants indoors can be a rewarding hobby, but electricity bills can go through the roof. Then you have to cool down all those big hot lights. It can drive a grower insane. With Lush LED Lighting, you can solve many of these issues and double your rewards. If you thought LEDs were meet the tech of today, Matt and his scientists have developed the perfect light for flowering plants with far less cost and heat. And the results? Let's just say I appear at a lot of events with the masters of indoor horticulture, and the harvests I saw from Lush LED Lighting were big, tight, sticky, and very effective. Check out LushLEDLighting.com right now and tell them Radical Russ sent you. Double your rewards and lower your expenses with Lush LED Lighting. I'm Radical Russ Belville, and I want to thank you for listening to 420 Radio. We couldn't survive without you and our sponsors, and I'd like you to check out one of our prime sponsors, the National Cannabis Coalition. I've been working with NCC since June of 2012, and I'm proud to be part of the team they have assembled. National Cannabis Coalition is building the partnerships with reformers, lawmakers, and industry we need to be successful. Visit the National Cannabis Coalition website at nationalcannabiscoalition.com or the easier-to-remember ncc420.com. That's where you'll get the exclusive first look at my radical rants, as well as informative articles from the nation's top cannabis pundits. Visit ncc420.com today, and if you have your phone handy, text Russ to 42420 to support NCC and 420 Radio. It's a free text message that helps us help you end adult marijuana prohibition. Learn more at ncc420.com, and thanks for supporting Independent Marijuana Legalization Public Radio.
Welcome back, everybody. 12 after the hour, we're continuing the story here of uh, David Eckert, uh, the man who was violated by the police and medical staff at the Gila Regional Medical Center in New Mexico for rolling through a stop sign. Ooh, what a nasty criminal. So um, continuing this uh, talk about the warrant that they got in this particular case, uh, pretty sad situation here. And let me bring back that page. Here we go. So um, in the last factor, we were talking about the anonymous tip, the anonymous Hidalgo County canine officer who claimed that he'd worked, he'd caught Mr. Eckert before and knows that he hides drugs up his ass, right? Well, Mr. Eckert says drugs were never found in his ass by any law enforcement agency ever. <laughs> he says it's never happened. If that's true, that means either the canine officer lied to Chavez or Chavez himself is lying about this. And of course, if there's any lie involved in this, that entire search warrant is completely invalid, which, by the way, folks, it was already invalid. All of these procedures that were done, the search warrant was specific to the county where Deming, New Mexico, is located, the Gila Regional Medical Center is in a different county. So geographically, they weren't under covered under the warrant. And the warrant expired at 10 p.m. Uh, the colonoscopy was performed at 1 in the morning. So, uh, let's, uh, so completely illegal searches. And this guy's, uh, this guy's case, this guy's lawsuit, this federal suit that he's going to put forward, should be an easy slam dunk case, I would think, in that situation since that warrant was completely invalid at the time it was being used now we also have this again is through popehat.com what is the quantum of proof necessary for police to rape and torture in new mexico that's the article and you can get this information there i'll post a link to it as soon as i can not only did they get officer chavez's report they found out which hidalgo county canine officer was the one involved Right. It's not like we don't know who the canine officer was. It's that the judge that approved the warrant didn't know who the officer was. The officer was never named in the warrant application. So in effect, as far as the judge was concerned, that's an anonymous tip. And that judge should have required some corroboration or some identification of the tip, especially if it's a cop, for God's sake. You think you could look that up in the records, right? So. We found the incident report from the Hidalgo County canine officer and his report on the incident says, well, it doesn't have any knowledge. It doesn't mention any knowledge about Eckert and doesn't say that he mentioned anything about Eckert to Officer Chavez. Interesting, huh? Now, Hidalgo County officer, the guy's name was Orozco says on his report that he informed Chavez that Eckert had a drug history, but did not mention anything in the report that he knew Eckert had hidden drugs in his rectum. So, nothing on the canine officer's report, but according to the arresting officer, the canine officer told him that this guy hold, uh, hides drugs up his ass. <laughs> uh, now, this is pretty terrifying, this case. And first of all, from a personal perspective, I don't know how many of my listeners out there have ever had the joy and pleasure of being anally searched by police. I have. I was arrested when I was 17 years old for a reckless driving ticket and had to spend two days in jail. As a matter of fact, the judge was a friend of my dad's. <laughs> That's a whole other story. But um, I had to spend two days in jail. And when you go to jail, they strip search you. You got to find out if you're you know, bring it in a shank or something. I don't know. So at 17 years old, I had to strip in front of cops, had to squat and cough, had to have one of them put the glove on and poke around in there and make sure I wasn't bringing anything in. And I'm a pretty laid back guy. I'm pretty relaxed. I'm not homophobic or anything like that. So, I mean, 
it was degrading. It was humiliating, but it, I, I, I didn't leave a lasting psychological scar on me or anything. But I might be different than a lot of people. I was reading Anthony Papa's uh, response on this. Anthony Papa's with uh, uh, Drug Policy Alliance. I think it's Drug Policy Alliance he works with. But anyway, he was a former prisoner. He did 14 years, I think, in prison and describes his searches in prison, which I imagine are far worse than the ones that you get in, uh, you know, just the county jail. But he describes his searches as some of the most humiliating, degrading things he's ever experienced and has nightmares about it to this day. What's this guy David Eckert's life going to be like? How is he ever going to interface with police officers again without trembling in fear? I mean, this guy, I guess on the... I, Probably has post traumatic stress disorder and can qualify for medical marijuana in New Mexico. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist gallows humor. The, the, the bar that a search warrant has to clear in order to do an invasive bodily search is a higher level of standard, right? It's it, the, the Constitution protects us from unreasonable search and seizures, and case law has already settled that you have to have a pretty damn good reason to search inside someone's body. Here's, here's a, a report. This is from uh, the Volokh Conspiracy, which is a, uh, it's a Supreme Court kind of blog. And they write this. Uh, Oren Kerr is the Fourth Amendment expert who wrote this. He said, quote, the key case is Winston v. Lee, which expressly considered when the government can get a warrant to perform surgery on a suspect for evidence in their body. Under Lee, the court must conduct a balance, uh, a balancing of the overall invasiveness of the surgical measures as compared to the need for evidence to say whether a warrant can be used to allow the surgical technique. On the wall, test it for alcohol in a The balance of this is asked. How animal is it to put this guy through 14 hours of torture to half stop a small handful of drugs? Amazing, right? So Eckert. Uh, argues in his complaint that the warrant's invalid because it did not specify the level of surgical intrusion. It did specify uh, not limited Law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. 
Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, The Russ Belville Show, Ganja John, and Cascadia Concentrates, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Adam's meticulous designs are individually crafted and screened in vibrant high-definition color. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. Big Daddy Think. Oh yeah, this is Big Daddy, and I'll be your freakazoid every Thursday night, right here at the Funky Roller Ring. Mm. Funky Roller Ring. 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, only on RadicalRust.com. Go, go, go. Ill Productions, West Side Strong coming at you, baby. This is how we do it. Check this out, homie. Don't you sleep. We about to creep. We're gonna take over the whole thing. I should have been born with a blunt attached to my mouth. Just off of one ten South City of Green. Get the cream and be out. Pops taught me how to hustle. Told me, Tommy, never open your mouth. So unspoken is what the list is about. Backpack zipped equipped, 12 ounces of soul. Crack back a quick fifth by the Red Bull. Only rolling with a click tight clan. It's either me and my man or 30 other brothers repping the band. Cali never was the type to pretend. I'll tell you straight to your face that you ain't shit. Then I'll spit in your hand. Have you exit in a coroner's van? So never step to me, homie, if you ain't ready to war with the veteran. Been in it for years, spitting on the grind for a minute. On a taste for the papes, waiting on the day I'ma get it. See me on top, lavish with the life that I'm living. Never giving a second thought, so I took it instead. City and angels, city of dreams, but everything in the West ain't always what it seems. Gotta hustle for the cream, holy roll with a strong team. About to dominate the scene, never sleep like crack beans. City and angels, city of dreams, but everything in the West ain't always what it seems. Gotta hustle for the cream, holy roll with a strong team. About to dominate the scene, never sleep like crack beans. I hail from the city of Southgate, everybody stay heated there for a high crime rate. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry about the technical difficulties, just got back on the line here, and uh, we're continuing this story of David Eckert, the man in New Mexico who was uh, anally raped by hospital staff and, under the direction of police in New Mexico. And when we left off before the break, we were talking about how under Winston V. Lee, there is a, a much stronger requirement for searching inside someone's body with invasive surgical procedures than there is for just a search of their car, their house, their person. And make no mistake about it, a colonoscopy is a surgical procedure. You have to be sedated for that. Anytime you go under anesthesia, folks, it's, you know, you can die. It's not likely. I mean, most, most anesthesiologists are great folks and, you know, qualified and all, but you can die in surgery. So as I left, I was telling you about how that this case the scariest part about it may not be what happened to this guy. The scary part about this is that when this goes to court, the courts might find that the cops weren't violating this guy's right at all. See, there's this thing that cops get to get away with called good faith. Good faith. And the idea is if the cop applies for a warrant, and the judge grants him a warrant, and he goes and searches where he's supposed to search because of that warrant, but then maybe goes a little beyond the bounds of that warrant, as long as he was doing it in good faith, it's okay. You know, as long as he 
sincerely believed in his heart of hearts that he was doing the right thing, then he'll get away with it. And it's possible. It's possible, and this goes to trial. And their defense will bring it up. The cops' defense will bring this up. That, oh, they were just acting in good faith. The Hidalgo County officer said, this guy hides drugs up his ass. And Well, gee, I got a warrant, and I was just trying to find if there was drugs up his ass. Oh, sure, we looked with an x-ray, and then our fingers twice, and then enemas three times, and then another x-ray, and then a colonoscopy. But it was all in good faith. It's all in good faith. There's a decent chance that the judge might find perfect justification in that warrant. What's terrifying about this is that the, the judge may decide that trying to stop a handful of drugs was worth 14 hours of torture. That's the scary proposition of this case, people. And I can't tell you how many cases I've gone over where the evidence of police misconduct is so shockingly obvious, and yet the cops get away with it. How many, how many cases can we name in the next five minutes, do you think? I know Rolla J used to tell me about that story of the, uh, the kid out in Oakland, shot however many times in the back by the cops. Amadou Diallo in New York City, anally raped by cops in New York who were shoving broom handles up his ass. The, the immigrant who was shot 41 times in his, uh, in his doorway in New York. There's, there's a whole host of these cases, folks, where cops exhibit some of the most barbaric and, and awful practices, and the courts will let him get away with it. Because, gosh, it's a tough job being a cop. Sure is dangerous out there. Gee whiz, they were acting in good faith. This is what the war on drugs has brought us to. It's brought us to a point where the simple and plain meaning of the Fourth Amendment, that there shall be no unreasonable search and seizures, has been so perverted in this war on certain American citizens using non-pharmaceutical, non-alcoholic, tobacco-free drugs, that we've lost all common sense. We've lost all common sense. And we've incentivized it. We've incentivized this. You know as well as I know that these cops in New Mexico and all around the country get bonuses. They get, they get grants from the federal government specifically tied to how many drug arrests they make, to how, ma how much contraband drugs they take off the streets. We don't have federal grants to send uh, cops after rapists. Cops don't get any special bonuses or any special grants if they take murderers off the streets. Cops don't get any, any, special, uh, any special dispensation or asset forfeiture when they're, when they're taking down graffiti artists or vandals or thieves. We have set up a situation in our country under this war on drugs that incentivizes us to go after things that aren't crimes and ignore things that are crimes and to commit crimes in the process. This is insane. And what are we, what are we going to do about it? This is why when I hear this story of David, Hidal, uh, David Eckert, oh, and by the way, I don't know if you heard my show yesterday. This isn't the first time this happened. There's another guy, Timothy Young in New Mexico, same canine officer who also was subjected to anal searches, who also had a warrant that was good for one county, but he was anally raped in the other county. This is going on all around this country. And how many men aren't bringing this up? You know, I, there, there, there's a lot of guys out there, and I'm not going to say they're homophobic necessarily, but bringing up the fact that some cops and, and doctors were shoving, sho shoving stuff up their ass may not be the first topic of conversation they want people to know about, how many of these kind of incidences don't get reported for the fear, for the shame these men feel? This is going on in our country, in our name, with our tax dollars. So when I hear people and I read people on the internet, people on our side, people who are marijuana supporters, 
who don't like this initiative or don't like that bill because it's not true legalization. Why? I-502 doesn't let me grow any plants. That's not true legalization. Why? Colorado only lets an ass. That's not true legalization. You know what true legalization is, people? True legalization is, number one, that which makes the ballot. Number two, that which passes. And number three, that which makes marijuana no longer contraband. If this story had happened in Washington state, that drug dog would not have alerted for marijuana on the guy's seat because the drug dogs in Washington state and in Colorado now are being trained to ignore marijuana because it's not contraband. And because a drug dog can't tell the difference between an ounce of weed and a pound of weed. This is why every step toward legalization, especially those steps that end criminality for mere possession are so important. When marijuana is not contraband, the smell of it is no longer probable cause. When marijuana is not contraband, this guy would be to shove an ounce up his ass if he wanted to. That'd be perfectly legal. Might not be comfortable. Might want to take the stems out first. But still, it would be perfectly legal. And that's why it's so important to dismiss these this sky is falling chicken littleism of marijuana. Oh, it's not good enough. Every step that takes us further away from cops taking us to hospitals and searching our ass for weed is a positive step. All right, so if you'd like the information on this, again, this is off of popehat.com. And the topic is called, What is the Quantum of Proof Necessary for Police to Rape and Torture? And Learned Hand once said something that I think is pretty apropos here. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. No constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. Liberty's up to us. It's up to the people of New Mexico to oust this sheriff in this county. It's up to the people of New Mexico to recall and disbar this judge. And it's up to us to tell everyone we know through Twitter, through Facebook, through all the social networks we can to pay attention to this story. Because, <laughs> you know, people out there who aren't familiar with drugs, that don't do drugs, that aren't pot smokers or whatever, they don't really get the breadth of this drug war and the abysmal depth to which it sinks. They really don't get it. They really think that the people that go to jail and get harassed by cops are, well, they're big bad drug dealers. They're awful drug addicts. They're, they're terrible people. This guy didn't have any drugs on him. Didn't have any drugs on him, in his car, anywhere near him. This guy could have been your brother. This guy could have been your dad. This guy could have been your coworker. Rolled through a stop sign, was a little bit nervous, and a drug dog supposedly smelled something that wasn't there. That could happen to you and me, folks. And people need to know that these cases aren't isolated, shocking incidences, these are just the ones that happen to come to the surface. In addition to the two cases we've got in New Mexico of two men being anally probed, we've got four women in Texas, two different cases where two women are traveling in Texas. Cops pull them over, suspect that they're hiding weed in their bodies, call female troopers out to hand inspect their ass and vaginas with the same pair of gloves. They didn't switch gloves in between. On the roadside, in front of the dash cam. And these cops, and, and people just think that that's just standard operating procedure. That's what we gotta do to try to stop the scourge of drugs. People need to know this is happening. People need to know 
This is what the drug war inevitably leads to. Inevitably. We have got police policing things that aren't crimes, but things that are vices. And you know the difference, right? A crime is something that hurts someone else. A vice is something that might hurt you, but you and anyone else involved in it is a willing participant. That's a vice. Gambling's a vice. Prostitution's a vice. Using drugs is a vice. Let's have the cops go after crimes, and we'll worry about our own vices. How's that? All right, we've got to take a break. We'll be right back. Stick around. Talk to Talk Radio. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. It's simply business. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. No herb thrasher from the herb thrasher flower hour now get ready for herb age designs for the proud cannabis consumer herb age designs lifestyle gear for the 420 friendly herb age designs home of the famous lighter leash herb age designs get your herb age t-shirts and hoodies and show your pride herb age designs we've got frisbee golf discs and durable hemp gear Herb Age Designs. We've got shot glasses, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, and beer cozies. Check us out on Facebook and online at HerbAgeDesigns.com. And follow Herb Age and Herb Thrasher on Twitter. We'll see you at this year's Hemp Fest. Crank it up. Дани Данько. Я редактор журнала High Times. Отвечаю за отдел культивации, или, проще говоря, выращивания. Приглашаем вас в Амстердам с 24 по 28 ноября, чтобы посетить ежегодный турнир Cannabis Cup, уже 26 по счету. Там мы сравним множество видов марихуаны и кашиши из межных кофешопов. Еще у нас там выставка товаров, Семинары по выращиванию, ночные концерты и вручение премии за лучшие в мире сорта марихуаны. Хотите получить 10% скидку со стамойста билета? Используйте промокод Данько на сайте cannabiscup.com. Ждем вас! This is Willie Nelson, or Norman, and if you're one of the 26 million Americans who smoked marijuana last year, you need to get involved in the drive to legalize marijuana. We need your help to stop the senseless arrest of more than 800,000 Americans each year on marijuana charges. Together, we can end marijuana prohibition and stop the arrests of marijuana smokers. To learn what you can do to help, contact Normal at norml.org. Our call toll free 888 normal. All right, welcome back, everybody. It is 40 after the hour here. And coming up next on 420 Radio, I believe we got Jorge Cervantes TV, some of the best grow information you could possibly want to know. And later on tonight, 8 o'clock p.m., Big Daddy Finks, Funky Roller Rink. Stay tuned for that. All right, time for us to take calls. You are the voice of the Marijuana Nation at 971-533-7111. We got a phone call here from the 617 area code. Go ahead, you're on the air. 
Hi, I'm calling from Boston, and I just want to take a minute to um, thank you as a supporter and listener for all the coverage from the DPA conference in Denver. Well, you're welcome. Um, I, I loved it, and um, I, it was cool. I felt like I was, you know, there, kind of just being able to listen to Ethan Nadelman's keynote, and I loved the reverend who spoke right after him, and um, the awards uh, videos that you got, and uh, it was just well, thank you. It's been it, so cool. You can catch uh, you catch up on all of those on my uh, YouTube page at uh, Radical Run YouTube. I've got them all uploaded now. I've been meaning to upload three podcasts. I think I got ten of them up, but uh, I ran out of time before I had to take off. So when I get back, I'll try to upload the rest of those for you. Okay. Nice. Well, um, and was it was it just awesome to be in Denver where it's totally illegal and was, uh, yeah. that, was that fun i you know i've been to denver a few times since legality has uh taken hold i guess uh so it's not new to me but what was exciting for me is all the other people that were there not just from the united states but internationally and and watching them experience legality wow that was just amazing yeah yeah, we, so, we, so we had I people was from New hear. Zealand. Uh, we had people from New Zealand and Portugal and uh, just a lot of Africans. Were there. We had some African delegation uh, were there, and they went on these tours. They took them on tours. You know, uh, I don't know if you saw them from the uh, River Rock Dispensary and their big, massive industrial grow they've got. Well, they, they took them out yeah. there. They took them out there and they toured them around and showed them what a warehouse grow looks like and what a dispensary looks like and. And I always think that's the number one activism we can do is to show people the plant and to show people people using it and the commerce of it so that they're not afraid of it. Yeah, that's, that's so true. And, so, you know, it looks like you guys do some cool social events too, that party. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Vicente Cedarberry party, that must have been really cool. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and, you know, people, uh, when we talk about these uh, these these reform conferences and normal conferences and such and hemp fest. Uh, some people might make light of, oh, it's just a bunch of partying. But really that partying is networking. It's meeting people yeah. and, and, and forming alliances and relationships that will last for years. And so I would encourage you, you're in uh, Boston. Uh, the 2015 reform conference is going to be in Washington, D.C. So... Yeah, I, I would love to try to come and just think if D.C. decriminalizes or even legalizes by then, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, it would be pretty, pretty amazing to, to make that statement in Washington, D.C. And by the time 20, I mean, really, uh, by the time 2015 comes around, we're going to be in such a different political landscape with marijuana. We'll have already had uh, Oregon and Alaska will have legalized by then. By 2015, they'll start ramping up the campaigns in California and Maine and, uh, you know, a bunch of places. And uh, Maybe it, even Massachusetts. Maybe yeah. even Massachusetts, yeah. And so this is going to be, you know, by the time 2015 hits and we're in Washington, D.C., I think the wind will be at our backs. And we'll also be looking forward to, a, you know, the, the presidential race will be heating up by then, too. By 2015, we'll start to see, you know, the campaign ads for the Republicans and the Democrats. And they're not going to be able to avoid the marijuana issue. Not anymore. Oh, yeah. That's going to be really exciting. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Well, um, and did you get to, uh, do you know Ethan Nadel, you know, did you get to meet Ethan Nadelman? Oh, yeah. I've worked with Ethan in the past yeah. a, a few times. In fact, uh, the last reform conference I was at was in Albuquerque. And I forget if that's 2009 or 2007, but I want to say 2009. And I actually was invited by him to do a presentation on marijuana prohibition to his staff. So, yeah, oh, I've, nice. yeah, so I've worked for Ethan in the past. He's a great guy. And uh, he gave me a really good um, endorsement uh, on my uh, you can see it on my uh, Radical Rust page down at the very, very bottom. If you scroll to the very bottom of my Radical Rust dot com page. There's an endorsement there from Ethan Nadelman. Oh, nice. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you go but thanks for all work and all the cool coverage that you bring us well you're welcome and you're the reason i keep doing it <laughs> thanks all right have a good day
Phone lines are open at 971-533-7111. And I got to find something else to talk about because, you know, my blood pressure and all. If I go any longer on this New Mexico thing, I'm, my head's probably going to explode. I still have somewhat of a stuffed nose as it is. So, <laughs> But, yeah, this um, we, we're getting such good news now with respect to uh, marijuana legalization and people's attitudes toward it. Uh, these polls that have come out recently, 58% support. I, I don't, you know, the things that they're, they're saying about it is, oh my God, what amazing jump in support for marijuana legalization. When Prop 19 was trying to legalize in California, the Gallup poll that came out, I think it was six or seven days before the election day, the Gallup poll that came out seven days before Prop 19 was to be voted on, showed American support for legalization at 46%. 46% in 2010. And now 2012, we get two states at 55%. And the Gallup poll now shows 58% support. So did we really increase 9 to 12 percentage points of support between 2010 and 2012? Here's what I think. I think there's always been this kind of support for marijuana legalization. There just hasn't always been people willing to say so. Who wants to admit to an anonymous pollster on the telephone representing the federal government that you're breaking state and federal law, <laughs> right? That's the problem. And becoming more acceptable, I think people who were already wanting to support just yield now that they can. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the phone lines. We've got a call coming in here. Is this Electric Bob out there? Yep, it's me again. Hey, hey Bob, what's up? Hey, what's up? Uh, are you setting one up now? So I figured I'd bring something up. Have you heard of the story in out of uh, South Carolina about the cop, uh, a client favoring legalization on a person's Facebook page? Yes, I did read that, and I was going to go. I was going to rant on that a couple, two, three days ago when this New Mexico story came up and kind of bumped it. But yeah, that's definitely something I want to cover. Uh, yeah, this guy posted some pro legalization comments on Facebook, and the and the cop there says, "Yeah, next time I see you, I'm going to search or whatever it was, just threatening the guy basically." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just just wanted to bring that up, and the story out of New Mexico screwed up like. I, 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 I better about being in Arizona because at least no one's getting butt raped here for some pot. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, not that, not that Joe Arpaio wouldn't support that. Well, Joe Arpaio, he's old. <laughs> he'll, he'll be out soon. Let's hope he's, so. He, he's all, the, the, the man's almost ninety for for crazy. <laughs> he shouldn't, he shouldn't be anywhere near law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, isn't it weird how so, some of the most evil, corrupt nasty bastards live to be 90 <laughs> you know yeah, right. john, john lennon gets shot in his 40s and this guy lives to be 90 what where's the justice in that yeah all the the, the assholes fail yeah well maybe he's just too mean to die i don't know what it is but uh yeah that south carolina story that's that's frustrating too because this happens also uh, where you know people who stand up to change the laws will get directly intimidated and threatened by these cops. I mean, it happened to our friend Lindsey Reinhardt, you know, trying to pass a medical marijuana law in Idaho and cops show up and take her kids away. Yeah, exactly. It's like, how, how are we, how are we supposed to do when, it, when these cops are always rah, 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 it's illegal. We're going to bust you. We're going to throw you in a cage. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, oh, there's another story too, um, out of Missouri where a cop uh, posted a Facebook Thanks. post about uh the, um, the, what's that the, the show me cannabis right right where where they were having a town hall meeting on marijuana legal it was like oh i saw all the stoners that were out there their perfect example is why we shouldn't legalize they're all on welfare and you know this is this awful shit well the update on that is that the guy from show me cannabis john payne challenged that cop to a debate and the cop has accepted Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah, I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to be watching out for that video. Yeah, and I'm... because it's 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 it screwed up too. Because one of the main guys there is uh, I forget his name, but his dad's doing like I think life for yeah. for some for pot. Yeah, one yeah one one of the main guys who runs it with uh, with the other person 
his, his father's doing doing life in Missouri because it's uh, three, yeah. three strikes are out regardless. Yeah, you, you, you can you can be caught with three grand like three grand, like one gram three different times, and they'll throw you in for life. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, it's 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 insane, and and, and uh, you know it's great that the uh, the Show Me Cannabis guys are going to debate this cop and. Uh, Show Me Cannabis is part of the National Cannabis Coalition, which is a sponsor of our show. So I'm going to be getting in touch with these guys to see if there's any way we can do a live stream of this debate and uh, bring it to all you guys. That would be great. And everyone text 42420 to Russ to show them your support. There's Russ. Text Russ to 42420. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I always forget. Yeah. Okay. Okie dokie. I'm out. All right. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for calling in. Appreciate it, man. All right, and uh, yeah, this uh, this is uh, going to be interesting as we watch law enforcement try to react and adjust to losing their easy cash cow. So, I mean, when you think, at least when I was growing up, I used to watch cop shows when I was growing up, you know, one Adam 12, one Adam 12, Columbo, Kojak. Uh, I can't remember how many shows I used to watch. There were cop shows. And, and, and generally, you were wanting, you, you thought of the cops as the guys that protected you, as the guys that kept the neighborhood safe. If there was trouble, you're going to give give them a call. And the people that went into the, had that added as well. But with the war on drugs, we've, we've changed our police officers from to protect and serve to search and seize. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. We'll talk a little bit about more about a break. Thanks for joining us. You're listening to Toker Talk Radio on 420radio.org. What makes something funny? How does humor impact health and psychological well-being? How can you incorporate humor into everyday life? A concise reader-friendly introduction to an important but often underappreciated topic in modern psychology, Humor 101 explains the role of comedy, jokes, and wit in the sciences and discusses why they are so important to understand. Psychology professor Dr. Mitch Earlywine draws from his personal experiences in stand-up comedy to focus on how humor can regulate emotion, reduce anxiety, and diffuse tense situations, expose pretensions, build personal relationships, and much more. He irreverently debunks the pseudoscience on the topic of humor and leaves readers not only funnier, but better informed. It's part of the Psych 101 series from Springer Publishing, Humor 101. Welcome back, everybody. Just a few minutes here before the top of the hour. Coming up next, we've got Jorge Cervantes TV, so stay tuned for that. And at 8 o'clock, Big Daddy Thinks Funky Roller Rink. So I'm here in uh, Boise, Idaho. I lived here in Boise from, oh, let's see, probably 1986 through 2003 when I, when I left the state. Terry Joyce can host a show like no one's ever seen. But that's only because no one's ever seen her host a show before. That's why I'm asking you to watch the Hollywood Hempress Hour with Terry Joyce. You can trust me because I'm a warlock. Which is honor. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? The most effective method for baking pot brownies? The best destinations for a ganja getaway? How to hide herb in your car? Whether to grow your own? How precisely to legalize it? Or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place? Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, 
High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook wove all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history, profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everybody. Four minutes to the top of the hour, and remind me when I get back to the studio to delete those Terry Joyce ads that are so low in volume. <laughs> Sorry to step all over that, but when I'm out here on the remote uh, setup, I don't get to see my uh, Liebermater screen, so I'm kind of flying blind here, and apologize for talking over the end of that. Like I said, Big Daddy thinks Funky Roller Inc.'s coming up at 8 o'clock tonight. Make sure you stay tuned for that. On tomorrow's show, we will be here once again in the boy idaho we've got our high times preview coming up we'll be talking with mike g from high times magazine tell you about the latest issue and the upcoming high times cannabis cup and i hope you enjoy those ads i got an ad in russian an ad in dutch and an ad in spanish from the high times folks and uh, really enjoy running those it's pretty cool listening to danny danko speak russian isn't it sure wish i could be heading out to amsterdam unfortunately the one-way ticket to amsterdam or the Round trip ticket from Amsterdam to uh, Portland is $1,200, so we won't be making it this year, but who knows? Maybe we'll get some uh, big sponsors in the coming months, and we'll make that happen. So I'm here in Boise, Idaho. Got a chance to visit my folks uh, hanging out in the state and uh, made contact with Bill Esmondson. He was the uh, proprietor of the 45th Parallel. This was the dispensary in Ontario, Oregon. And uh, basically, you know, Idaho weed is completely illegal in every possible way. And Boise is 50 miles away from the Oregon border. And right across the Snake River, right across the Oregon border is Ontario, Oregon. And back in the day, that, that was where we used to all go drive to when we wanted to go buy a new pot pipe. Because there's no head shops in Idaho either. <laughs> Although one interesting thing, I have seen a lot of vapor shops here in uh, Boise. Uh, for the e-cigs, uh, there was two big vapor shops, there, and I stopped into one of them looking for, you know, something. But they're all liquid vaporizers. They're all for those e-cigs. They're all for those nicotine liquid things. They didn't have a single herbal or concentrate vaporizer available. Oh, well. Oh, look, that's not all the time we got here for some vapor talk. We'll be back tomorrow with more news, you and the music. We love the Earth. Earth. Radio. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com.